Live from the Julia Morgan Ballroom in San Francisco. Extracting the signal from the noise. It's the Cube, covering Structure 2015. Now your host, George Gilbert. This is George Gilbert. We're at the iconic Structure 2015 conference, downtown California at the Julia Morgan Ballroom. And we are privileged to have David Idicharia, <laughs> I've mangled that one. That's okay. Um, chairman and CEO of MongoDB. Yes. Mongo has taken the world by storm over the last several years. Um, for decades, we were accustomed to SQL DBMSs with hardcore transaction processing. What allowed uh, MongoDB to take off? Sure, the, uh, the company was founded by uh, people who saw the data management challenge um, like 15 years ago. So the founders of MongoDB were, were the founders of DoubleClick, the, one of the largest uh, global ad serving network in the world. And they were serving billions of ads per day. And what they struggled with was having a data management platform that could deal with that amount of volume of data. And what they realized is that a new solution had to be built, especially with the nature of applications as data just going you know, to the next level. And so that was the catalyst for them to start MongoDB. And that bet has paid off. You know, MongoDB was built on a vision that you needed a platform that was incredibly flexible. You needed a platform that was massively scalable. And you needed a platform that could run anywhere, either on premise or in the cloud. Okay, so let's take those vectors perhaps one by one. So, in terms of flexibility, um, is it that developers didn't want to keep going back to central IT and ask permission to add a field or a table? Or was it that machine, more and more of the data was sort of machi machine generated and you, know, you couldn't really predict exactly you know, what components that would have? Well, I think bef you know, with the uh, relational database, um, you know, there was lots of benefits with the relational database. It was like a standard way of writing and reading data for an application. But there was an inherent tax involved in terms of how you'd work with a SQL database vis-a-vis -vis the development language you're using. So there was this translation layer from the development language you're using to, to uh, um, your, uh, your uh, relational database. And in those days, you know, data used to be in nice rows and columns, so that was e you know, you know, pretty manageable. Well, a couple things changed. One is you know, the, the nature of data has changed. You know, we now have data can be a video file, it could be a graphic, it could be unstructured text, it could be machine data. So data, the nature of data has changed profoundly. Second is the volume of data has just exploded. And third, the nature of how applications are built are incredibly agile in the sense that people don't want to have six month release cycles, they want to have two week or maybe even daily release cycles, so people have to iterate. So they don't want to presuppose a solution that then they have to go you know, rebuild again. They want a flexible uh, architecture and so hence a schema that they can continue to adapt as their data requirements change. Okay, so um, that's all mom and apple pie and goodness. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, we all want that you know, ability to be flexible. And uh, what goes along with that is I don't have to exactly design up front every last thing about how I'm going to use the database. Exactly. But you trade off something for all that goodness, which is it's harder to do the analysis on the back end after you've captured that data, I assume. No, not, not, not necessarily. So okay. in fact, in our latest release of software, we've announced um, uh, the ability to connect the latest BI tools like uh, Tableau, Cognos, um, Click, or any other BI standard BI tool they're using to basically, you can basically um, access information from Mongo directly without using an ETL uh, solution. And so that becomes very powerful for people who want to do sophisticated analytics. And we are a transactional database, and so people want to do real-time analytics, and that's one of the biggest use cases. Okay, so then, all right, let's talk about the class of applications. We talked about flexibility and volume. Um, did, did Mongo start out as the a, a flexible way of developing an experience for a web or a, a mobile front end? And, and if so, has it evolved from there? It, MongoDB was built really to run anywhere. It was to be always on and run anywhere. So uh, whether you're building a mobile app, whether you're building a large scale 
you know, um, analytic, um, you know, e-commerce application, whether you're building an IoT application, if you want to run it on your prem, if you want to run it in the cloud, if you want to run it in a hybrid environment, you can do so with MongoDB. So you're not presupposed, you know, you're not kind of limited to any kind of underlying kind of architectural constraints. So that's very powerful, especially for say a small company that doesn't know how well the business is going to take off, they can build on MongoDB and know that the solution is fairly future proof. On top of that, we do offer some of the features that people still like from relational technology. We didn't think that the relational solution was all bad. Things like a very rich expressive query language, uh, things like strong consistency, things like secondary indexes are all features that developers use to make their applications uh, perform and perform optimally. And some of our, our competitors weren't able, didn't really focus on that, they just focused on making people trade off the features from relational versus the flexibility performance and scale of uh, of uh, next generation uh, databases and we allow you to actually, in some ways, have your cake and eat it too. Okay, have you found that the class of applications you're being used for has changed over time with, Absol absolutely. with these new features that you're adding? Absolutely, so it's a really a function of the maturity of the product and comfort you know, by customers. Customers are starting to trust us more for more and more of the mission critical applications. So originally they may start, us, you know, start working with us on some skunk works or some prototyping and maybe some tertiary applications, but as they got more and more comfortable, as their developers you know, became more and more familiar, and as the product added more and more capabilities, they, and you know, we've added capabilities not just for developers, we've added tools and solutions for operations to run and manage Mongo at scale. We offered solutions, like it's mentioned, for the business analyst to be able to access data quickly. So uh, it makes Mongo much more appealing to a larger population. So with that, we're seeing Mongo evolve from kind of these you know, early prototyping projects to truly mission critical applications, whether they're new applications or sometimes they could be you know, moving workloads from legacy platforms to MongoDB. And so that's what's really giving us a lot of excitement about our business. Even if you have to anonymize, can you tell us some of your largest deployments and, and sort of the characteristics of those apps? Well, I'll tell you, the, of the Fortune 100, every one of those uh, organizations is either a customer or user of MongoDB. Um, we have, um, you know, we have some of the largest uh, financial services firms, you know, who are deploying MongoDB as a as a platform, either to move workloads from existing platforms or for for some of their new applications. We have the largest uh, retail, uh, e-commerce, um, you know, um, telecom and cable companies using Mongo for a variety of different applications to run their business. And so, uh, and then we also have people like small companies who are essentially betting their business on Mongo. I'll give you a couple examples. One really interesting example is a company called Oxford Nanopore Technologies. They've built a palm size um, a device that essentially allows you to take any living molecule and decode the DNA of that molecule in real time, in, or in essentially four to five minutes, and they use Mongo as the data ma management platform. So what they do with this device is essentially stop the spread of like diseases like Ebola in like places like West Africa. That's so always that's a good a, that's, thing. That's pretty, <laughs> that's pretty profound. <laughs> yeah. We have another, uh, you know, we have like Bosch, who's a pioneer in IoT, who's leveraging Mongo to add more and more sophistication around the sensors that they offer in, their, in the devices that they sell. Let's drill into this a little bit because IOT is of intense interest to um, customers right now, and you know we're hearing about it all the time. Um, the IOT sort of application architecture is somewhat different from you know traditional transactional applications. Sure. What does it look like in in this case? Sure. So well, you know, with IOT. And any individual piece of data is not that interesting, it's really the aggregation of data over a period of time that becomes much more interesting. But the key part of IoT is that you need a platform that can be inherently flexible because the sensors you start using it today right. may either change or you may add additional sensors over time. Look at your iPhone. Right. Your iPhone, when it was first introduced, maybe had two or three sensors. Today has over 15 sensors, right? So you can't predict what sen new sensors you're going to add and what data formats that data is going to be uh, need to be collected in, so you need to have a data management platform that allows you to collect that data quickly and to be able to synthesize that information quickly. So Bosch, for example, has standardized on MongoDB to essentially you know, drive their IoT business for okay. those particular reasons. But then there's also some very, very sophisticated um, predictive and prescriptive analytics that typically go along with the, the data that's streaming in now. It's yeah. not, it's, it's the center of gravity shifting from big data to fast data and from fast data to analyze it with you know very little delay. 
So, so that's, that a real like? that's a real ba benefit with Mongo is you can truly do real time, and I, what I mean by real time is sub-second you know, analytics, and, and, and our customers are pushing for us to do that because you know, obviously being the, the back-end database of every application, that's where the da data is uh, essentially generated or stored. Now you can obviously use technologies like you know, Spark or Hadoop to do much more sophisticated you know, analytics that require maybe not sub-second response, but people are using us for, you know, to your point, fast data, you know, and for many interesting use cases. Can you give us, not to get stuck on IoT, but like perhaps with Bosch, an example app that would help people understand, you know, like a concrete um, example? Well, for example, you know, um, they're big in the automotive uh, uh, business, right? And so, um, respecting the confidentiality, you know, they're embedding devices that car manufacturers are putting in to track information about, you know, what's going on in, in these cars, you know. There's some very well-known new car manufacturers who uh, I can't mention who may be using some of those sensors to provide real-time feedback on how the car is working and also to learn th things like you know driving behavior and other you know attributes of what's going on to be able to you know improve the driving experience uh, for uh, for their customers. Okay. Um, and I'll, gi I'll give you another yeah. example. Um, um, that's another pretty interesting app. Um, AXA Insurance. You know, when the Apple Watch came out, um, you know, earlier this summer, you know, they very quickly realized there was an opportunity for them. And what they did was they basically built an application called Drive Coach, which allows allows them to allows the user to track their driving behavior and say, "How am I driving?" You know, and it'll give you oh, feedback. Oh, and it's instrumented on the watch. It's instrumented not on the, the car. Exactly. And so, for example, they'll give them feedback on how how good of a driver you are, how quickly do you accelerate, how hard do you brake, how quickly do you take turns. And that feedback then helps the driver essentially become, uh, um, uh, that helps the driver essentially um, um, get feedback on how to become a better driver. Yeah, in real time, and, yeah. and, and so, and, and the value for AXA is that if that driver now wants car insurance, they have an immense amount of data to say, right. I can ascribe the certain uh, the type of risk for this kind of driving behavior. And, 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 uh, and obviously, AXA now is viewed as a very different company than a traditional insurance company. I'll be sure not to sign up with them. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, shifting gears to the commercial side somewhat, um, uh, database companies typically, or, or, or recently, they go into an enterprise and they get the developer as the design win, but then they need to sell to IT sort of as the IT's willing to pay for uptime. How does that affect you know, how you do business in terms of um, pricing, um, you know, the size of the sales force you have to feed, field? Tell us a so, little bit. So about we do that. offer today a, you know, a, a general purpose, you know, free product, we call it a community version that anyone can download and use for free. But then there are certain features that you know, if you need from a management point of view, if you need from an analytics you know, kind of point of view, if you need uh, uh, and other things to kind of run and manage Mongo at scale, that we encourage you to, to uh, um, use our, our commercial product, which has those features. We also have some advanced security features in those products, so that's important for certain industries. And so, so the way we uh, monetize you know, the community is for people who have, we find people who have very critical projects, so they're not necessarily science projects anymore, but the critical projects, and two, their predisposition to use some of our paid features. And typically, if, if, they're, if you meet both requirements, they tend to be you know, prime candidates for people who we can sell to. Do you find that um, your competitors are constrained by uh, legacy pricing models that, uh, you know, without naming any competitors, that they can't really break out of that business model? Yeah, I mean, it's a classic innovator's dilemma. Um, you know, what we're seeing is that our, the large incumbents, they're basically using pretty aggressive sales and pricing tactics to try and extract as much value from the customers, which customers are getting tired of. And so, on a cost basis, you know, people can easily, quickly, easily justify uh, 5x cost savings using MongoDB, and, uh, and the productivity gains are 10x. So, so it becomes a pretty compelling cost proposition for people to look at Mongo versus the alternative solutions. Okay. David, we have to stop it there. Um, this is George Gilbert. We're at Structure 2015. We'll be back in a couple minutes.